Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The FCC dismisses an amateur's petition to reverse amateur radio call signs. Jamboree on the air is alive and well, although the 2017 participation count is down from last year. We will have news from the International Amateur Radio Union and an 80-year-old Telefunken transmitter takes to the air. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites orbiting the planet. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will address net neutrality and other technology-related stories. Australia's own Arnold Venshop, VK6FLAB, asks, how can you measure what frequency your radio is actually on? We will have the second part of a talk with Mike Lisensko and 2YBB about the status of the Amateur Radio Parity Act and how it differs from PRB1. And our tower climbing guru, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, talks about mounting active electronics on your tower. That's all straight ahead, as edition number 979 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from high atop a nondescript building here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, overlooking the chilly and windy Empire State Plaza, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from the heart of central New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF in Syracuse, New York. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where snow might be right around the corner, and I'll believe it when I see it, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And reporting from the frosted conifers of the central western Catskills, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news, the FCC has dismissed a rulemaking petition filed last May by Thomas J. Alessi, K1TA of Stamford, Connecticut, that sought to amend the Part 97 rules regarding amateur radio service call signs. Here with the rest of the story is Carla Pereira, KC1, HSX, reporting from League Headquarters. The commission action came in a November 28 letter from Scott Stone, Deputy Chief of the FCC Wireless Telecommunications Bureau Mobility Division. Alessi had asked the FCC to make call signs consisting of one letter, followed by two digits, followed by one letter available to amateur extra class licensees. Alessi asserted that the number of amateur extra class licensees who desire short call signs exceeds the available supply, and that his plan would make available an additional 7,804 character call signs. In denying the petition, Stone wrote, quote, Approximately 15 million call signs are presently available in the sequential call sign system, but it does not include every amateur call sign that has been allocated to the United States, close quote. Stone also pointed out that the FCC had rejected a similar suggestion in 2010 that would have made certain additional call signs available to amateur extra class licensees, but concluded at the time that enough call signs already were available for every amateur radio licensee to obtain an acceptable call sign. In addition, the FCC said in 2010 that it had no plans to revisit the issue. Stone concluded, quote, You have not demonstrated any change circumstances or other reason that would warrant revisiting this decision, close quote. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. Statistics released by UK telecommunications regulator Ofcom indicate that the amateur radio population in the UK has grown by approximately 10% over the past five years. As of the end of August 2017, there were 52,195 full licensees, 9,739 intermediate licensees, and 22,649 foundation licensees. Figures recently released in response to a Freedom of Information request from Peter Boyer, G4MJS, covered the period from June 2010 and August 2017. The statistics also show 803 reciprocal licensees in June 2016. Overseas visitors do not need a reciprocal license if they are visiting the UK for up to three months 
from CEPT TR 61-01 signatory countries such as the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, or CEPT signatories in Europe. Ofcom recently issued reciprocal license holders with call signs that were indistinguishable from full license call signs. Ofcom now uses the term full temporary reciprocal license. In response to a Freedom of Information request for a list of available unassigned amateur radio call signs from Derek Fleewin, 2W0FLW, Ofcon responded, We no longer hold a list of available amateur radio call signs, as we now use a system that randomly allocates call signs upon request. The first amateur radio satellite to employ the D-Star digital voice and data format, D-Star 1, was among the 20 secondary payloads lost on November 28th after an otherwise nominal launch of a three-stage Soyuz 2.1 booster from the new Voschoni Cosmodrome in the far reaches of eastern Russia. The mission carried the Russian Meteor M2-1 satellite, the primary payload, as well as a Canadian Telestar experimental satellite and 17 other secondary payloads, including the D-Star-1. According to reports, a fault occurred in the sophisticated and autonomous Fregat upper stage, which, after separating from the launch vehicle, inserts multiple spacecraft into their respective orbits. A so-called space tug, Fregat has been in service for nearly two decades and has suffered three previous failures. Russian space agency Roskomos is investigating the Fregat issue. T-Star 1, the first German commercial CubeSat, carried four communications modules, Two designated for amateur radio use, it was developed by German Orbital Systems in cooperation with the Czech company iSky Technology as part of a plan to eventually assemble a low-Earth orbit communications network. Hopefully we'll get another chance to utilize D-Star Communications with a satellite repeater sometime in the future, said Wayne Day, N5WD, commenting on the AMSAT-BB. The Fregat upper stage functions as an orbital vehicle in its own right, to access a range of orbital configurations through a series of burns made up of six spherical tanks arrayed in a circle, Fregat is independent from the lower three stages, having its own guidance, navigation, control, tracking, and telemetry systems, according to Gunter's space page. The November 28th launch was only the second from the new Cosmodrome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. The votes are in, and the ballots have been tallied at ARRL headquarters in contested director and vice director elections. In a two-way race to fill the Dakota Division Director's Chair being vacated by Kent Olson, KA0LDG, the division's members elected Vice Director Matt Holden, K0BBC, of Bloomington, Minnesota. Holden had been appointed as vice director in February 2016 after former director Greg Wyden, K0GW, became ARRL first vice president. Olson announced earlier this year that he would not seek another term. In a four-way race for the vice director's chair that Holden will vacate, the winner was Lynn Nelson, W0ND of Minot, North Dakota. Nelson is the current North Dakota section manager. In the Atlantic Division, ARRL members chose former FCC Special Counsel Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, as Vice Director. In the Midwest Division, Director Rod Bloxham, K0DS, held off a re-election challenge from Cecil Miller, WB0RIW of Wichita, Kansas. Unopposed for new terms were Atlantic Division Director Tom Abernethy, W3T0M, Delta Division Director David Norris, K5UZ, Delta Division Vice Director Ed Hudgens, WB4RHQ, Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, Great Lakes Division Vice Director Tom Delaney, W8WTD, and Midwest Division Vice Director Art Seigelbaum, K0AIZ. All successful candidates begin new three-year terms on January 1st, 2018. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. The oft-honored Ulrich Road, N1UL, is the recipient of the Wireless Innovation Forum Leadership Award, formerly known as the International Achievement Award. 
The award recognizes especially significant contributions in furthering the global mission of the Wireless Innovation Forum. A prolific technical author, academic, and engineer, Rode is a partner of Rode and Schwarz in Munich, Germany, and chairman of Synergy Microwave Corporation in Patterson, New Jersey. While working under an RCA U.S. Department of Defense contract in 1982, Rhodes Department developed the first software-defined radio, which used the COSMAC, or Complementary Symmetry, Monolithic Array Computer Chip. Rode was among the first to present publicly on this topic with his 1985 talk, Digital HF Radio, a sampling of techniques at the Third International Conference on HF Communication Systems and Techniques in London. Since then, Rode has actively driven innovation in the field of SDR, both in industry and academia, the award announcement said. Rode holds some 50 patents. In December 2016, Rode was invited to deliver the Sir J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture on Next Generation Networks, Software-Defined Radio Emerging Trends at IEEE Hyderabad, India. In the 2017 edition of Communications Receivers, Rode and his co-authors set SDR at the core of modern communications systems design. A project in which Rode and Schwarz was involved was also honored. The Wireless Innovation Forum conferred its Technology of the Year Award on the German Armed Forces Joint Composite Radio Equipment Project, which had the objective of developing an SDR system for joint and combined operations for the German Federal Armed Forces. Rode and Schwarz, the lead industry partner in the SDR project, has facilitated the effort through its waveform development environment. Winners were announced at the Wireless Innovation Forum Conference on Communications Technologies and Software-Defined Radio, held in San Diego, November 15th through the 17th. Nearly 8,000 scouts got on the air for the 60th Jamboree on the Air, or JOTA, over the third weekend in October. National JOTA Coordinator Jim Wilson, K5ND, said... Wilson this week released the 2017 JOTA report, which declared radio scouting and jamboree on the air are alive and doing well. Facilitating the October JOTA activity were more than 900 radio amateurs and 525 stations. Propagation wasn't our friend, but even so, radio amateurs in almost 90 countries and all 50 states engaged in conversations with scouts during the weekend, Wilson said. In addition to HF, VHF, and UHF, many amateur radio digital modes were in use, as well as online jamboree on the internet channels. The tally for JOTA 2017 was 7,872 scouts on the air, which Wilson pointed out was down from the 10,761 who took part in JOTA 2016, but more in line with 2015's participation. Reports were filed by 226 JOTA locations. The Boy Scouts of America National Radio Scouting Committee will be exploring several improvement projects for 2018, Wilson said. These would include establishing a JOTA frequency task force to explore updated frequency listings and operating recommendations, looking into new ways to alert participants in real time about other JOTA stations that are on the air. The Radio Scouting Committee's work in 2017 resulted in the introduction of the new Radio Merit Badge requirements, which included a new option for amateur direction finding, or fox hunting. The panel also developed documents to help scout leaders incorporate radio and JOTA in their unit activities, including Cub Scout Program Helps for JOTA and Boy Scout Troop Meeting Plan for Radio. Wilson pointed out that the very successful K2BSA operation at the 2017 National Scout Jamboree in July introduced amateur radio to nearly 2,500 scouts, with 305 earning the Radio Merit Badge. The Amateur Radio Parity Act of 2017, S1534, is alive, but with legislative action slowed to a glacial pace on Capitol Hill in recent months, there's been no real progress to report since this past summer. For more details on the Parity Act, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from ARRL headquarters in Newington. 
The Amateur Radio Parity Act of 2017, Senate Bill 1534, is alive, but with legislative action slowed to a glacial pace on Capitol Hill in recent months, there's been no real progress to report since this past summer. At present, the bill is under consideration by the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation, and it remains an active concern for ARRL. The League is working diligently to shake the bill loose and move it forward. While it may appear that time is short, the bill does not need to pass the Senate by this year's end. We have until the current session of Congress adjourns, which is not until December 31, 2018. Once the bill passes both houses, the FCC would still have to implement its essence in the Part 97 Amateur Service Rules. Introduced on July 12, 2017, the bill marked another step forward for the landmark legislation. Senators Roger Weicker, Republican from Mississippi, and Richard Blumenthal, Democrat from Connecticut, sponsored the bill in the Senate. The U.S. House version of the legislation, H.R. 555, passed the House of Representatives by unanimous consent in January 2017. Introduced on July 12, 2017, S. 1534, marked another step forward for the landmark legislation. Senators Roger Wicker, Republican of Mississippi, and Richard Blumenthal, Democrat of Connecticut, sponsored the bill in the Senate. The U.S. House version of the legislation, H.R. 555, passed the House of Representatives by unanimous consent in January 2017. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm speaking with Rob Macedo, KD1CY, the Director of Operations for the VOIP Hurricane Net. And we're going to talk about Skywarn, but first, maybe we better define what is Skywarn. So Skywarn is the National Weather Service's volunteer weather spotting program where timely, severe weather reporting based on our reporting criteria that the Weather Service sets helps protect life and property. So during severe weather events, uh, amateur radio Skywarn spotters will report in based on the criteria that their local offices set and there's training offered by many weather service offices in the spring through fall of each year. Okay and I always think when I think Skywarn of hams going out with their their handhelds looking at uh, rotating clouds and, and that sort of thing. Is that a a reasonable definition or, or not? Well, that's one example and, and certainly done in the uh, spring and summer months during tornado season, but could also be that winter storm where we need snowfall reports or, or a heavy rain event where we need rainfall and flooding reports. So it can be uh, those situations could be like a, a nor'easter in the northeast that uh, also can produce the snowfall and heavy rainfall or icing or wind damage. So it's all those other components as well, even uh, coastal flooding along our shoreline. Now, coming up in a short time, we have Skywarn Recognition Day. What day does that occur, and uh, what is it? So, uh, Skywarn Recognition Day is uh, Saturday, December 2nd, 0 to 2400 hours UTC, and it's an event that uh, was put together by the... Uh, Goodland, Kansas National Weather Service Office as a way to promote the Skywarn program and also to thank all those uh, amateur radio operators that are active in Skywarn. Uh, uh, thank them for their reports and their uh, t their service because there are times where some warning information and and such can only be confirmed by spotters on the ground and those reports can become critical. So it's a, a fun event to get National Weather Service offices on the air to uh, thank the spotters, to do communications over HF, uh, VHF, UHF, uh, cover the local repeaters that Skywarn can be on, uh, also uh, Echolink, IRLP, DMR, all those other modes. Depending on the Weather Service office, they could be on some or all of those modes. Some ac are active for the full 24 hours. Others uh, may be just during uh, certain portions of the day. Uh, you can check out uh, the uh, Central Region uh, Skywind Recognition Day website for uh, more information. Okay, very good. And I hear the W1AW will be on the air as well. Yes, they'll be on the air. They, they'll be using a special call sign WX1AW for uh, uh, their uh, participation in the event. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Rob. All right. Thank you. The amateur radio clubs at National Aeronautics and Space Administration centers around the U.S. have invited the amateur radio community to join the NASA on the Air special event, otherwise known as NOTA. The event gets underway in December and continues through December 2018. In addition to being the agency's 60th anniversary, 2018 will mark 50 years since NASA orbited the first human around the moon and 20 years since the first elements of the International Space Station were launched into low Earth orbit. 
Starting on Monday, December 11, 2017, amateur radio club stations at various NASA centers and facilities will be on the air with special event operations to celebrate these monumental achievements as well as current milestones. Some clubs will offer commemorative QSL cards, and a special certificate will be available indicating the number of NASA club stations worked on various bands and modes. A NASA announcement said, quote, We plan to have a web-based system for you to check your points total and download a printable certificate at the end of the event in December 2018. Points will be awarded for each center worked on each band and mode, close quote. That would, of course, include contacts with any of the amateur radio stations on the ISS. Skywarn Recognition Day takes place on Saturday, December 2nd from 100 hours until 2400 UTC. During the Skywarn special event, operators at stations in National Weather Service offices will contact radio amateurs around the world. Participating stations will exchange a brief description of their current weather with as many Weather Service based stations as possible. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. The correct object has been identified for AO91 or FOX1B and will now appear in the KEPS as AO91. Remember, on AO91 you must correct for your Doppler on the uplink. If you do not, you will sound muffled until the satellite is at the middle of its pass for your location. The satellite has a very good receiver and AGC, which helps. FOX-1D will be launching soon. There's also word that the Chinese have frequency coordination on seven new satellites that will be launching. There are so many satellites operational now that you will have a lot to choose from when it comes to playtime. Whether you prefer FM, sideband, CW, or digital, there should be something up there for you. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. One question I got via email concerning tower mounted electronics and where to start. Here's what I did on my latest 900 megahertz install. Concerning feed lines, I use the 900 megahertz band for a one-way link between my recording studio at home and the local repeater for airing this week in amateur radio. Feed line loss at 900 megahertz is horrible unless you intend to spend lots of money on pressurized semi-rigid feed line. One solution to this problem is to mount the electronics on the tower and limit the feed line to say two or three feet. It's easy to run 115 volts AC up the tower. Make sure the wires you choose to install are the outdoor type with three wires. Also check with the tower owner to be sure it's legal to do so. Probably any lighted or registered tower would require you to, to run the power wires through conduit. Actually, running conduit on the tower is rather easily since it's generally in a straight line. Okay, so you've installed the power to the place where you intend to mount the electronics and antenna. Your next job is to find a suitable cabinet. If your space requirements are small, like the size of a small HF rig, you're in luck. For those needing to obtain and tower mount a larger cabinet, here's how I handled a couple of those projects. First, we gathered all the equipment to be put in the cabinet on the tower and arranged it to take up minimal space but allow sufficient cooling airflow. Then we located a cabinet that came close to the size and height and width. I took it to a local welding shop and had them cut all the way around the outside, splicing five inches of steel to make it deeper. After the bill was paid, I sealed it with silicone and paint and tested it with a water hose for a watertight seal. I did install two drain holes in the bottom just in case. For smaller projects, marine battery cases work well for housing tower-mounted electronics. You'll need a mounting bracket of some sort and some holes in the box, but they're cheap and durable. Ham fests are good places to look to pick up plastic boxes for outside mounting. I found several with molded in nuts for mounting, clear plastic doors with key locks for real cheap, my favorite two words. Some common mounting devices for electronics on the tower are hose clamps, antenna U-bolts, most brass screws and nuts, as well as custom-made brackets from scrap steel. If you live in an area with a large industrial area, try to get to know someone that works as an industrial electrician who can help you scrounge old steel electrical cabinets, scrap steel, wire, and other hardware. Most of my best outdoor installations were made from old control cabinets destined for the scrap steel bin or the landfill. And while you're building your tower mounted box, be sure to consider how to safely put it on the tower and gain access to it. Remember, money spent on books and videos relating to tower safety is always money well spent. Invest in your safety soon. Don't be a statistic. 
This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakaba, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. Leo Laporte, kick it, the tech guy. Any way that the internet and the computing and digital technology are changing our lives, that's what we talk about right here. And boy, they are, aren't they? Are you all loaded up? Get your Black Friday deals on. Monday is Cyber Monday. That's the silliest thing ever, Cyber Monday. Although it outpaced, at least with online sales, it outpaced Black Friday last year, $3.5 billion to $3 billion. So I guess there is something to that, that uh, Cyber Monday thing. The theory was in the past that people w you know, people didn't have very fast internet at home, so they'd wait till Monday and then uh, do their uh, shopping at work. <laughs> That's kind of a nutty idea. We don't wait till Monday to do our shopping anymore, do we? But uh, on the other hand, uh, I would imagine if those were, did anybody get any fist fights uh, on Black Friday? Where they where did gunplay break out? I don't know. Seems like it would be a lot safer online. You don't have to get up early in the morning. But I mean, if you do, you're in bed when you're shopping. I don't have any numbers yet for Black Friday, but I imagine it was, uh, it was a big shopping day. Everybody, I know traffic was terrible around all the outlet malls and the shopping malls in our area. You know, it'll be interesting if the, uh, if the net neutrality rules uh, pass December 14th, the anti-net neutrality, the new rules pass that allow a, your ISP to shape your bandwidth, we say that euphemistically, to decide what you can and can't see and how much you pay and how much the other guy pays and all that stuff. Be interesting to see what happens next year uh, on Cyber Monday and Black Friday. You know, what kind of online shopping? You know, I, mean, I can imagine a scenario where uh, your, your ISP, I can see my ISP, Comcast, doing this. Say, yeah, if you want access to Amazon, uh, let's see, who would they go to? Would they go to me? No, I already pay enough. They'd probably go to Amazon. Hey, Amazon, if you want access to uh, our customers, our, uh, our millions of uh, customers, you're going to have to pay us a little extra for that access. A little toll road. How about that? That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Be good. be a good payday for Comcast. I'm not sure how good it would be for the rest of us because, of course, what does Amazon do? Well, they just put it all in the prices, right? They just, they just uh, mark up everything a penny and everything's all right. Everybody's happy. So, so we end up paying for it, don't we? It's an interesting uh, situation, this uh, net neutrality thing. I don't think the general public cares that much about it. Maybe you do. Maybe because you listen to the show, you know about it. First of all, because it's a terrible name, net neutrality. What does that even mean? Uh, maybe, we, maybe we should say we'd like to ban internet discrimination. Even that doesn't kind of make a lot. Because I think people don't even think of the... People think of the internet as just hot and cold running websites, right? They just pour into my browser whenever I ask for it. It's kind of a miracle of, of the 21st century. You just You just... Open up a computer, you click a button, and all of a sudden something shows up. You know, you can buy stuff, and then two days later it actually shows up on your doorstep. You can watch a movie, and it's just kind of this free-flowing stuff. We don't really think about much, do we? Well, we might have to at some point. I mean, the FCC has decided to ignore, completely ignore, uh, even though they're required to, the comments of the public to... Uh, to dis just dismantle this whole protection of the internet. They say, well, we didn't have it two years ago. This will be the, the, uh, the great internet we had a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. There's some examples, though, of companies not behaving too well. You remember when Netflix wasn't very usable on Comcast because they were in a fight? They wanted Netflix to pay money. Netflix said, what, to pay money to access our, your customers? Yeah. Netflix said no. Netflix got worse and worse. I don't Do you remember that? When you really couldn't use Netflix if you're a Comcast customer? I do. Eventually, Netflix paid up and it all went, got better again. That's what we're talking about. That's happened. That's the great internet of two years ago? I don't think so. But it's hard to get people to care about it, you know, and, and partly because we've bought, we fought this battle before and, and won, but uh, we're going to, I think we're going to lose this time. December 14th, the commissioners of the FCC will vote, eliminating all uh, uh, 
regulation of internet service providers. It's not regulation of the internet. Don't don't get fooled by that. Oh, we don't want any government regulation of the internet. No, it's not. It's not. It's a, it's the exact opposite. It's government keeping internet service providers from messing with the internet. Hands off. Comcast blocked BitTorrent for a while too. Remember that? Because they said, well, that's people are using that to steal music, except they weren't just using BitTorrent to steal music. They were using it for a lot of other things, including downloading my podcasts legally, distributions of Linux legally, lots of stuff legally, but Comcast didn't like it. So they turned it off. They can do it. Fortunately, uh, their customers got upset and they changed their mind. And I'm, I wonder if the FCC might have gotten into it a little bit, just a little bit. FCC did get into it a, a couple of years ago. Remember when Verizon... Which, uh, by the way, big internet service provider, not just in uh, phones, but also in homes. But on your phone, if you had a Verizon phone, you, the, Verizon was sending out a uh, unique identifier without well, actually attaching it to you. A unique identifier that they would then sell to anybody who, uh, who paid the fee so that uh, websites and advertisers and so forth could identify you on the internet and collect information about you on the internet. You know, when Verizon got caught doing this, the FCC caught them and fined them and they stopped. I don't think that would happen anymore either. We want a light hand on the internet. <laughs> hey, there's a, a program you should not buy called Computer Cop, C-O-P. It's, it's billed as an internet safety program, you know, that keeps your kids safe. And, and the way it keeps uh, your kids safe is it, it puts a keystroke logger on your computer that t takes note of everything that's typed in the computer and then sends it to an email server to send it to you. And then you can see what your kids are doing on the, on the internet. Internet safety, we call it. It was distributed free by uh, many uh, law enforcement and government agencies. 240 agencies distributed it, often uh, as a CD with a picture of uh, some elected law enforcement official, a sheriff, a mayor, a district attorney. Right on the cover there. See, I'm giving you this internet safety free. It's a first step to protect children online. In Arizona, the... Uh, Maricopa County District Attorney's press officer got this together, made marketing materials, said perfect election. Oh, the marketing materials for the for computer cops said perfect election and fundraising tool. Well, it turns out the Electronic Frontier Foundation, good group, another group, by the way, against uh, against this new FCC repeal of net neutrality. The Electronic Frontier Foundation said, um, you know, that's uh, <laughs> that that's a security problem because it's transmitting everything you type on the keyboard without encryption in the clear over the Internet to an email server when it's being mailed out again. In other words, anybody who knew you were using the software could, could, could capture your keystrokes, get your passwords, your credit card numbers. And then to make worse matters worse, when they, when they pitched themselves to law enforcement agencies, they, they circulated a bogus letter of endorsement from an official in the Treasury Department. Treasury Department just concluded its investigation and said, yeah, no, <laughs> that, was, that was bogus. I don't know what's going to happen to Computer Cop, but if you're if you're uh, in San Diego County and your district attorney offers it to you for free, don't take it, don't install it. If you got it, uninstall it. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Imagine what somebody traveling in time from 1955. Just imagine, you know, they they'd look at the airplanes and they go, well, you know, uh, yeah, you, you know, you have jets now. We had some jets then, but uh, I see you've used jets and. They're still pretty much the same. In fact, there's some airlines still flying planes from around that era. You know, and he, and he, he might look at our cars and say, well, yeah, you know, I mean, the, some nice designs, but boy, I, I sure could drive one. I wouldn't have any trouble getting in the getting in the car and driving it. Pedals in the same place, brakes in the same place, works pretty much the same. You've got airbags. I don't know what those are, but they, they don't change how I use the thing. But then, say, well, come here. Let me, let me show you my TV. <laughs> and I think he'd feel like he'd entered the future, which he had. I mean, in 50 years, cars haven't changed that much. Airplanes haven't. A lot of our technology is pretty much the same. The incandescent light bulb. And then some of it's changed so much. We've gone from vinyl records to CDs. Our TVs are suddenly vivid and real and amazing. And he might not even be as amazed by the fact that you can get a little camcorder the size of your hand and shoot video that looks that good. You can edit it on this thing called a personal computer. That might amaze him. And, and and do what? Put it on what's the Internet? Well, you see, you, 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 have, you're, you have this computer. Now, I think a computer you'd kind of get. It's just a shrunk version of, you know, the IBM mainframe somebody from 1955 was used to. He'd kind of get the idea. Oh, oh, I see. You shrunk it down. I get, oh, it's color. That's pretty nice. Very vivid looking. Yeah. You use this pointer thing, this, this mouse. I see. It moves the arrow around. That's kind of neat. The keyboard. Oh, I recognize that. <laughs> yep. 
That's the same one uh, Mrs. Marcos taught me to type on in uh, in high school. Yeah, it hasn't changed. Qwerty, huh? You'd think in 50 years they'd come up with something better than that, huh? You'd recognize that, but boy, you say, well, see this video that I shot? See how vivid that is? I put that on this thing. I edited it down, put some titles on. Oh, that's pretty neat. It's like TV. Yeah, it's like TV, but then watch this. I press this button. It's now available instantly to anyone in the world with a similar computer and Internet connection. Oh, wow, that's pretty neat. How many people are there that, that can do that, he might ask? A thousand? That's pretty cool. Uh, we're not sure, but it's well over a billion. A billion? You're telling me you can shoot a video, edit it on this little version of a mainframe, and push a button, and a billion people can see it now? Yeah. Wow. That must change things a lot. Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. What's that little thing on the on the desk there that's uh, hooked up to the computer? That little the glowing thing. What is that? That's a phone. Where's the dial? Oh, we don't have dials. You don't have dials. No, no, no. See, watch. I press this button. It appears on the screen. and just touch it. Wow. Now, see, that probably, that iPhone probably looks more like Star Trek than anything else to this visitor, this mythical visitor from 1955. That's pretty amazing. Oh, and did I show you, you know, that video that we edited, put on the Internet a couple of seconds ago? Did I show you that I can play it back now on this phone anywhere? Uh-huh. Very interesting. That's what I love this business and i love this beat as a journalist there's no more interesting beat nobody dies nobody gets killed but it's fun it's interesting and it's it's important it's not insignificant yeah it's a toy store but it's also changing things significantly changing how we work how we live how we play you want to really blow somebody's mind from 1955 show them world of warcraft what's that well it's a 3d world i'm i'm i'm, I'm uh, playing a game you're in there oh yeah that's me see the the, the orc with the big axe? That's me. Well, no, what do you mean? That's you. Watch. And <laughs> you walk around, you interact, you fight in a world that to somebody from 1955 must seem amazingly realistic. Now, by the way, what I didn't mention is that the rate of change from 1955 to now, 50 years ago to now, is double or tripled. So you're going to feel like that guy from 1955 in about 15, 20 years, maybe less, maybe 10. The same kinds of amazing jumps will happen to us. I can imagine going over to visit my grandkids in there. Oh, sorry. Little Leo's playing in the holodeck. He'll be out later. Wow. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. It's very easy to criticize when you don't understand. I would encourage a little bit more dialogue and a little less assumption. That's the voice of Michael Lysenko, N2YBB, Hudson Division Director with the ARRL, the National Association of Amateur Radio, and Chair of the ARRL's Legislative Advocacy Committee. Recently, Rains Hapali, KC9RP, caught up with Mike on Skype to learn the ins and outs of ARPA, the Amateur Radio Parity Act of 2017. Hap began our second and final excerpt from his conversation with Mike, requesting a brief explanation as to the differences between the proposed ARPA legislation and PRB1, legislation many hams have benefited from the past several decades. We basically, the first time around, just took PRB1 and, and kind of put it on a bill and said, here, let's do this for uh, private land use, homeowner association type of development. The problem with that, of course, is, is that you have to realize that the folks who live in the district communities, these are their entitlements. And so it would be unreasonable to think that you're just going to walk in and basically roll over everybody and get PRB1 done. And so what happened was we were told by the powers that be in both parties on the House Commerce Committee that we needed to sit down and work out some sort of an arrangement that was satisfactory to both us and the folks from, who represented the homeowners associations. Without that, we never, ever, ever would have seen any legislation for us. They made that extremely clear to us. And so we sat down over a period of a number of months and literally worked out an arrangement where homeowners associations protected what they felt what they were already entitled to. And we got the guarantee of an effective outdoor antenna with no preclusion of amateur communications and having done so in the least restrictive manner. We basically got PRP1, but in terms of the way it's dealt with a deed restricted community as opposed to municipal zoning board. There are certain things that they needed to protect, such as the fact that 
homeowners association, their primary responsibility, as far as they see it, 99% of the times is the aesthetic concerns of the community. There would be no way that they would give up something that they already had the right to. One of the complaints that we heard is that, you know, well, you know, we have to go to a homeowners association to apply. And, well, you know what? You would have to do that anyway, even if this didn't exist. The bottom line is, is the homeowners associations through covenants that travel with the land for as long as that thing is in development. One of their entitlements is to uh, determine the aesthetic values of the property. Now, that's not saying that, that they're unreasonable. Sometimes they are. Uh, we've all heard of the pink Cadillac and the driveway kind of thing and silliness. That was a major concern for them. Some folks have complained that, well, I've got to go to them for permission. Well, you know what? If you live in a municipal zoning board, you have to go to a municipal zoning board for a permit. There are similarities all around. The ability to determine the maximum height, safety issues involved in putting a structure of an antenna structure, things like that. There's really no difference there than what would happen is if you went to municipal zoning board. So the, the bottom line is, is that they were looking to make certain that they didn't lose what they already had. On the other hand, we wanted to make certain that we didn't lose what we already had. So we made certain that the legislation only dealt with heat restricted communities. Anybody who lived in a deed restricted community, who are those who uh, live in a municipal zoning board area, PRB1 affected them and would not change so that there wouldn't be any of that crossover and we wouldn't have to worry about losing the ability to maintain PRB1 for people who live in communities that are not deed restricted. So there are a lot of similarities, there are a lot of differences, but the bottom line is, is that these are things that we needed to work out with both CAI, Community Associations Institute, and of course, both parties on the Commerce Committee. It was a long and arduous process. This leads us to November now, 2017. How much more time do we have? All right, the congressional session ends December 31, 2018. We have a little over a year still within this congressional session. Um, and that's critical to us because you have to make the assumption that the face of one, if not both houses of Congress stand a very good chance of changing come the uh, midterm elections. We would probably have to start from scratch if the face of either house changed dramatically. We've been very lucky in that the support we've gathered over the past few years is bipartisan in nature, despite the fact that you see some not so friendly goings on in Congress. We've been able to avoid that nastiness because we provide a critical service in time of need and we don't cost the taxpayer a penny. So we're able to kind of avoid some of the nastiness that's been going on. But Things have a habit of changing and you never know what will happen, but we do have until the end of next year to try to get this thing through in this session. So what can I, as the everyday ham, do to help? That's a good question. At this point right now, well, let me, let me take it back a little bit. We, over the past couple of years, we, especially uh, last year and this year, we've run either widespread or occasionally targeted emailings to various senators and Congress people. Also, uh, hard copy letters. We must have gathered thousands of hard copy letters at various conventions and the larger ham fests and all that. We had people out with uh, laptops and portable uh, printers printing out letters for members to sign basically asking their representatives to support the bill. Last year and this year, we've been using uh, targeted emailings. And these things we found are very important because when we're able to come in with literally thousands of emails and letters, the folks in these offices do perk up and do examine what these things are about and what's going on. The irony is, is that we've gotten letters back and they're all form letters after a while. We've gotten letters back where it was obvious that the individual did not understand what the bill was about. We had to go back to their staff and say, hey, we think you messed up on this. The bill didn't say this. The bill said that. Could you please do us a favor and fix it on your response? Well, usually they did. It was important to us to do that is because we were getting phone calls and letters and emails from members who were concerned that their legislator didn't get what they were talking about and was going to oppose the bill. That obviously was not the case and certainly not in the House where the thing passed very quickly on suspension of the rules. We've done a couple of emailing specifically to Florida as well as some media. But there's only so many times you can keep on sending the, uh, the same thing over and over and over again before people kind of get tired of it. What if I'm not an ARRL member? We are not allowed to solicit non-members for any purpose, but that doesn't mean that they're not able to send emails or write to their representatives or support the bill. And certainly 
they reach out to ask a question, the uh, question will get answered, and then we'll say to them, why are you not a member of the league? The league is your best advocate for amateur radio. It just occurred to me that obviously you can let a lot of folks know in a ham club if there is a video. But that's a good point. There is nothing current. Part of the reason for that is because the problem is so narrow at this point that I don't think we even thought about putting something out there in terms of a video when the problem is truly very frustrating, the whole being placed by one senator. I suppose those who are in Senator Nelson's jurisdiction, if they haven't dropped him a note already, they should. Well, what they could do is pick up a phone and call his Washington office and call his local office to them and say, I support the Amateur Radio Parity Act and I'm a constituent and we're not happy that you don't support it. Inundating that office with phone calls would send a message. And understand that you have to be respectful. You can't cross the line. And unfortunately, we've had some individuals who have crossed that line and make it more difficult for us in the long run because, let's face it, you want to treat people in the same manner that you want to be treated. And so when you do call up a legislative office, do it in a way that, that makes us look good, not bad. There is a lot of information on the ARRL website. If you just go to the homepage, we have an FAQ that we've put up there. And of course, you can get information information by reaching out to me as well and or your your own directors that would probably be the uh, the best way of reaching out if you have any questions and that concludes hap holly kc9rp's time with mike lisenko n2ybb chair of the arrl legislative advocacy committee and arrl hudson division director Editorial comment. You just may be fortunate enough today to not be living under the stifling umbrella of a homeowner's association with its covenants and deed restrictions. But that time may come, in which case you'll wish you had proactively participated in being a part of the solution. Supporting ARPA of 2017, not part of the ongoing problem many hams are living with today. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, bidding you very 73. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the ARRL Audio News Propagation Forecast for Friday, December the 1st. There is a single lonely sunspot on the edge of the solar disk, and it's likely to be gone by the time you hear this broadcast. According to the forecast, we'll once again be left with a spotless sun. There was a coronal mass ejection headed our way earlier this week, but we dodged that bullet and avoided some nasty geomagnetic storms as a result. For now, conditions are a bit unsettled, but not bad for a solar minimum. Granted, the solar flux index has dipped, and that's never good for the higher HF bands. However, the low band should be in pretty decent shape. Conditions, in fact, may be very good for the 160-meter contest this weekend. On VHF and UHF, we have major weather changes occurring throughout the country, and that has triggered some interesting tropospheric ducting band openings. One hot spot at the moment is northern Florida and southern Georgia. Another is along the California coast. And since we're entering December, be on the lookout for 6-meter sporadic E band openings between now and the end of January. The International Amateur Radio Union, or IARU, says significant progress was made during the World Radio Communication Conference 2019 preparations that took place earlier this month at International Telecommunication Union headquarters in Geneva. But the AIRU cautions that a lot remains to be done before the reservations and concerns of regulators and spectrum users are adequately satisfied. The team representing IARU in Working Party 5A of ITU radio communications sector consists of amateurs from Australia, Brazil, Canada, Germany, Ireland, Japan, Norway, the Netherlands, the UK, and the US. For IARU, the main focus will be on the WRC-19 agenda items that will consider amateur radio allocations in Region 1 from 50 to 54 megahertz that is similar to the ones available in Regions 2 and 3. The current mainly secondary allocation of 50 to 52 megahertz in most European countries is a regional agreement. 
Delegates to the meeting considered input documents from IARU, France, the Russian Federation, and Switzerland. A rough consensus was achieved on the text that will provide the technical basis for discussions concerning the access of the 50 to 54 megahertz band for amateur service. Additionally, some administrations accepted an IARU proposed method to calculate the spectrum needs of the amateur service at 50 to 54, but more information to justify the requested bandwidth will be required, the IARU said. For sharing studies, particularly in relation to land mobile service and radio location applications in the 50 to 54 megahertz allocation, a mutually agreed upon propagation model remains to be determined. No major objections remain to sharing with analog television broadcasting in the 50 to 54 megahertz range in Bant Region 1, provided that a time-limited field strength limit is applied. Other key issues affecting the amateur service remain to be addressed prior to WRC 19. These include the securing of the protection for amateur service primary allocations at 24 and 47 gigahertz, and minimizing possible interference arising from wireless power transmission for the charging of electric vehicles. Following the meeting of Working Party 5A and other meetings related to the work of ITU-R Study Group 5, the ITU hosted the first of three planned interregional workshops on WRC-19 preparation. IARU Vice President Oli Garpestad, LA2RR, also attended the W5A meeting representing the IARU at workshops and to hearing of reports on progress by the regional telecommunication organizations. This is Don Hewlett, K2ATJ, reporting. Foundations of Amateur Radio The frequency you listen and transmit on in a modern radio is derived from a crystal master oscillator. In my case, 22.625 MHz. That master frequency is multiplied and divided to determine the final frequency. To get to 2 meters, you need to multiply by 6. To get to 70 centimeters, multiply by 20. Similarly, to get to 40 meters, divide by 3. Any slight variation of the crystal frequency has an impact. 100 Hz variation in the master oscillator causes the radio to be off by 600 Hz in 2 meters, or 2000 Hz in 70 centimeters. The higher you go, the bigger the error. This leaves us with two problems. If the crystal changes frequency over time, your radio wanders with that change, which is especially noticeable on the higher frequencies. I've previously discussed how you can deal with the variation by correcting for temperature. The other problem is the actual absolute frequency. If the radio is set up for a crystal with one frequency and you replace the crystal with a different one, how do you know what frequency you're actually on? Your dial says one thing, but is that the actual frequency? How do you measure any difference? Is a new radio the same as an old radio? Does the frequency change over time? Measurement is the act of comparing two things. Think of a ruler, wooden stick with markings on it. If the lines on the stick are not drawn in the right place, anything you measure with that stick will not match other sticks. That won't matter if you only ever use your stick to build everything, but typically you use parts supplied by someone else with their own measuring stick. In your radio, the same is true. What the actual frequency is doesn't matter until you need to compare it to the frequency of someone else, like say another radio station. The first thing we need is something to compare with, a reference frequency. As it happens, there are several of those around. As an example, you'll find reference broadcasts on 5 MHz, on 10 MHz, 15 MHz and 20 MHz. There are countless other frequencies where you'll find radio time signal stations. These stations broadcast on a steady frequency with a defined signal that you can use to do measurements against. Even your local broadcast stations have a carrier that you can get started with. A typical radio time signal will be an AM station with all manner of information encoded on the transmission. You can tune your radio to the station and hear a talking clock, second marks, etc. Unless your radio is seriously out of whack, you're unlikely to be able to notice any frequency errors. If you tune to the same station with sideband, you'll hear some artifacts, but essentially you'll hear nothing. However, if you tune slightly off frequency, you'll hear a tone. This tone is the central carrier frequency, and it's very accurate. At this point, you can do many things. I'll cover one of them. I'll explain this with 10 MHz. If you set your radio to upper sideband and tune to 9.999 MHz on your radio, you should hear a 1 kHz tone. 
Similarly, if you set your radio to lower sideband and tune to 10.001 MHz, you'll also hear a 1 kHz tone. In essence, you're listening to the carrier as a 1 kHz audio tone. You can swap between the two frequencies by setting one on VFO A and the other on VFO B and switching between them with the AB switch on your radio. If the tone changes, your radio is off frequency. How much off frequency is determined by the difference between the two tones. By lowering both frequencies by the same amount, or raising both by the same amount, one of the tones will go up while the other one goes down, and vice versa. Once you've got both the tones the same, write down both frequencies, split the difference, and you'll know what frequency your radio thinks 10 MHz is on. You'll need a radio with both upper and lower sideband, and the ability to switch between two frequencies. And before you get started, you need to make sure that your radio doesn't have any frequency changing stuff turned on. RIT, clarifier, offset, whatever it's called on your radio. All of them need to be off. There are countless other ways of doing this. A procedure called zero beating with a signal strength meter. Using a tone and listening for a wobble in the sound. Using an external second receiver and zero beating against that. Using a computer to generate tones. Using the FMT software included with the Whisper software. And likely many more. The point of all these processes is to detect a difference where there shouldn't be one. One final comment. The most accurate process at this time without specialist measuring equipment is by using your Whisper enabled computer and the FMT software that's included. I'll look at that next time, if I can understand what Joe Kilo One Juliet Tango wrote on the subject. Happy measuring. I'm Ono, a Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And finally this week, on Sunday the 26th of November, the Burgeon Broadcaster Association Group of Amateur Radio Enthusiasts celebrated the 80th anniversary of the inauguration of the Telefunken LWMW transmitter station, originally established in 1937. The transmitter was ordered in 1935, finished in 1937, and came on the air on the 28th of November and is apparently the only one remaining in existence. The rated power was 20 kilowatts and it was in service until 1978. The antenna, a wire T, was suspended between two 150 meter lattice steel towers. These were taken down in 2000 and thereafter a 30 meter section re-erected. The site has museum status, and transmissions of mainly historical interest are made on 1314 kHz almost every Sunday, from 1100 CET to 1500 CET. This last Sunday, listener reports were received from the UK and Finland, amongst others. A Western Electric 250 watt sender from 1947 has been used for these transmissions, but a more modern transistor transmitter is providing to be more reliable now. A parallel FM service is being re-established on 93.8 MHz and on 5895 kilohertz. Another service is operated using AM with a reinserted carrier. The associated amateur station LA1ASK was on the air on 80 meters for most of the period, as it is every Sunday. Excursions can be made to other bands using a selection of dipoles suspended from the 30 meter mast. The main amateur station equipment is an IC7600 and an ACOM PA. There is also a connection through Echolink. The museum is open every Sunday from 1100 to 1500, and it is situated on the island of Asquai, just west of Bergen, Norway. The website can be found at bergenringcaster.no. That's B-E-R-G-E-N-K-R-I-N-G. K-A-S-T-E-R dot N-O. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, amateur radio newsletters from around the world, sources on the Internet, and the packet bulletin board systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, 
please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.